Thank you for your practice. And stretch or move the body in any way that's helpful. giving these kinds of talks, it's sometimes no, difficult to know where to start. And you have a teaching in mind, it's like, where do you start? Or if you're trying to come up with what would be interesting, talk about where do you start? Um, <clears throat> so I thought I would start with like sort of from the beginning, um, the Buddha's first teaching after his enlightenment. Um, I love the stories around the life of the Buddha. You know, there was, uh, could go back even further, <laughs> start earlier. But after his awakening, you know, it's the beautiful stories and the teachings about his awakening and first his like uh, conquering the hindrances in meditation, uh, armies of Mara being defeated, and then uh, his remembrance of uh, his own and countless other beings past lifetimes. This, uh, some of the ways describe the knowledge of the expansions and contractions of universes over eons, sort of like meta metaphysical knowing that he usually refuse to talk about. And, uh, you know, the legend is that he spent 49 days just sitting at the base of the tree, basking in this uh, bliss of freedom and uh, then was trying to decide what to do. And he, um, so, you know, of course, teaching comes to mind, but he's sort of just discounted. He's like, what I've, he thought to himself, what I've learned is so subtle and so um, elusive that, uh, you know, people won't understand what I have to say. And then in the legend, the god Brahma, the four-headed god Brahma appears to the Buddha and says, you know, there are beings with just a little bit of dust in their eyes who will understand this teaching. And so the Buddha was encouraged to teach. And uh, <clears throat> trying to think of an audience. And so he, in his you know, Dharma eye, reflected on teachers he had had when he first left home. And he realized that they were deceased. And uh, <clears throat> so he found his sort of band of five other comrades who he had practiced with and uh, gave them this seminal, first and seminal teaching. It said that that teaching that um, began the rolling of the wheel of Dharma, it was, the, it was so uh, profound. It was like the sound of a lion's roar reverberating through the, the earth. Uh, this is the teaching of the Four Noble Truths. And um, so that's what I wanted to talk about today. Um, <clears throat> the Four Noble Truths are, drum roll. The first Noble Truth is the truth of, I'm gonna use the Pali word dukkha, the truth of dukkha. We'll talk about what that is. Uh, suffering, this is a shorthand. Um, <clears throat> The second noble truth is the cause of this dukkha is clinging. You could say clinging and aversion. Uh, the third is the possibility of release from dukkha. And the fourth noble truth is this uh, points to the Eightfold Path of Practice, which is the like, systematic way of um, <clears throat> aligning your life in a way that uh, leads to ultimately the elimination of dukkha. <clears throat> so this word dukkha is very peculiar word and a uh, very important and peculiar word in Buddhism. 
uh, translation we most commonly get is suffering. Um, like many of the translations, they come from Victorian era British aristocrats and uh, or uh, bureaucrats, actually more accurate to say, uh, who were in uh, India and Sri Lanka in the 1850s. And so, but this word dukkha um, <clears throat> is used in many different contexts in the teachings. But the etymology of it is something like an axle that is off kilter, like a wheel that is not true. So the effect of that is that the ride is really bumpy. And if, you're, if your axle is way off kilter, like maybe the, the ox cart or the car doesn't even run, like it's just frozen. Um, and uh, the, the insight of the first noble truth is the realization that this is the characteristic of things in this plane of existence that for most of us the ride is pretty bumpy <laughs> and uh and that sort of like things so experiences possessions um but I would say conditioned things, things that arise through causes and conditions are inherently unsatisfactory. And this is, this is like right away puts us at odds with the conventional way of thinking throughout time that, you know, that the way we achieve a sense of happiness or well being or contentment is through getting something, getting rid of something. This, viewpoint is very much on steroids in our consumerist capitalist culture. Um, <clears throat> ideas about, you know, all the things that we need to have in order to be happy or successful. And uh, right out of the gate with this thing, you know, none of these things will lead to lasting satisfaction. We can't hang our hat on conditions to provide some sort of like refuge or reliable source of, of well-being. <clears throat> and the word dukkha is used in, you know, seemingly contradictory and ways to get into the subtlety of the teaching because the Buddha says, birth is dukkha, life is dukkha, old age is dukkha, sickness is dukkha, uh, death is dukkha. <clears throat> and these are kind of like the unavoidable, uh, and yet it says that, you know, mindfulness is the path for uh, the alleviation or elimination of dukkha, like Nibbana, this cooling off or this place of uh, uh, fruition of the path um, is possible. And yet we know that as far as we know, sickness, old age, and death are uh, inevitable. So there already there's a kind of contradiction in the way the terms are being used. <clears throat> and the kind of the, the nuance is that when the Buddha is talking about the elimination of dukkha, suffering, stress, just be the whole range of like, just not quite right to the things that really torment us and disturb us. Um, these things may be unavoidable, but the kind of mental reactivity, to use the modern word, the kind of mental anguish that um, so naturally comes along with those experiences, that's the part that can be um, eliminated. So a quote, um, <clears throat> in the case of a well-taught noble disciple, this is, you know, these things are, it's a very patriarchal lineage that's all written in uh, masculine, which I'll just read. Uh, o oh monks, when he is touched by a painful feeling, he will not worry nor grieve nor lament. He will not beat his breast and weep, nor will he be distraught. It is one kind of feeling he experiences, a bodily one, but not a mental one. <clears throat> Um, uh, 
I think the first time I heard this teaching, you know, like <clears throat> one thing I appreciated about it was the sort of acknowledgement that life is hard. And as a young person, I always felt like whenever I had some distress or suffering or something wasn't going my way, that it was kind of user error, that I had failed in some way to execute the proper strategy or um, you really take it as a personal failing. And uh, it was actually relieving to hear somebody say, like, this is actually the way it is, is maybe even the way like it's supposed to be. Like, so the insight is that you know, condition, things in the conditioned world are unsatisfactory, that this human existence is carries a modicum of these really challenging difficulties. Um, but there's also a practice instruction that's embedded in the teachings. So there's the realization, and this is a realization that, you know, often comes in meditation that you realize like it's so difficult to find a place of refuge, a place that's comfortable, a place that, of ease. Um, because even as you get calmed down, then there's more and more subtle levels of this sort of like streams of discontent and agitation. But the practice instruction, like what do you do with this insight is suffering is to be known. This is also very counterintuitive to our impulse when we make contact with something that's in the realm of suffering, unpleasant, painful, hard to bear, that almost a primal instinct is to run the other way. <laughs> But the, the teaching is that we attend to this suffering that we, by making contact with, by becoming intimate with, by really understanding, looking it in the eye, we develop a, like we turn suffering into something worthwhile, something that is, uh, so suffering is actually the catalyst for a path of freedom. And what I love about this teaching is that you can carry this teaching with you anywhere and everywhere, because wherever you look, there it is. Wherever you go, there you are. <clears throat> and actually, uh, a practice that I do a lot is when I notice those, even those little moments of discontent, a little moments of agitation or irritation or frustration. There's a series of questions that um, <clears throat> are really helpful to work with. So the first thing is having the mindfulness to notice it. So, you know, having a daily practice, developing a modicum of mindfulness. So we're not just going through the world in autopilot that you can tune into these moments of it's not quite right, something's really upsetting here, the mind is spinning in some kind of reactivity, or the mind is just like not steady in some way. Uh, and in these moments of suffering, the questions to ask, what is it that I think I need? And that's phrased very particularly, <laughs> what is it that I think I need? What is it that I think I want? What do I think should be happening right now? What do I think should not be happening right now? Or what am I afraid of? And these are all ways of getting at the second noble truth, which is that the cause of suffering is some kind of clinging. So embedded in all these questions, what does it think that I need? is a clinging to an idea of like something that's missing that would make everything okay. Or what is it I think should be happening or not happening is like illuminating a, a paradigm or a belief or a view that's keeping us caught. 
what am I afraid of? Fear also has a, uh, a analogous in some ways to the feeling of clinging or actually the, the Pali word that's used to uh, the language of the Buddha is uh, thirst. It's like aching thirst for um, whatever it is we think we want or we need or the way we think should be is the root cause of all our suffering. So many words. <clears throat> so suffering is to be known. What do I mean by that? Or what does the Buddha mean by that? And this is where our meditation practice is building all these skills to recognize what's happening and awareness to um, tease it apart or deconstruct it. So in any experience, we can notice there's a set of thoughts. There's a story. Um, usually whatever story is appearing in awareness, we kind of just take at face value, but there is often a story around our suffering. We can recognize that story for what it is, thoughts appearing in the mind. Um, one of my favorite quotes is thoughts appear in the mind like saliva in the mouth. And we don't usually like make a big deal when saliva appears in the mouth, it just comes and it goes and it's not a big deal. We can actually develop that kind of relationship with our thinking. I've been just noticing this a lot that, you know, when you really pay attention, when I really pay attention to my thoughts, make it personal, uh, there's about six or seven themes that just repeat in different variations. And then there's a lot of like, what I, I affectionately call garbage. <laughs> it just keeps appearing. And uh, this is a nice practice to like see when thoughts are useful. I mean, we need thoughts to navigate the world, to communicate with people, even to discuss uh, the things that free us. But um, sort of just nice to have a practice where you can just see the thoughts that are just not helpful and just sort of like usher them into the metaphorical trash bin. <laughs> So we can see that any experience has a story that goes along with it. And there may be ways to engage with the story, you know, with like talking about friends, talking to friends, talking to therapists, not to deny the validity of the story, but just in the, in the contemplative frame, relating to the story is often not helpful because the, you know, there's some truth in this story. Like if my story is that I've been wronged, that someone has done something terrible, well, they probably did do something terrible. And there's a kind of like a, there's no sort of like talking your way out of it. Uh, and then we, when we uh, engage at the level of story, that leads to a lot of thinking, a lot of conceptual proliferation. We lose contact with a more intuitive uh, way of knowing that be quite useful. So usually we say in the context of practice, notice the thought, notice the story, let it go. And then turning to the more granular, immediate aspects of the experience. What's there in the emotional realm? What's the emotional energy of that experience? Constellation of uh, sensations and um, feelings in the body that we can recognize and name, you know, uh, restlessness, I call that an emotion because, or anxiety maybe is the word because it seems to be the, the through line of existence in this modern time. There's so much happening on a collective level that is anxiety producing and then so much does have things happening on the personal level that are anxiety producing. So we can touch into, this is the experience of a human being experiencing anxiety. Uh, this is what anxiety is like in the body. That uh, recognition 
actually the, the recognition that there's suffering of some kind and that we're making contact with it, that's, you would say almost the whole of the practice, like you're, 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 you've set in course a series of events that if followed through on lead to a kind of palpable, pervading sense of freedom. Huge part of this is developing uh, the capacity to rest with and bear with and tolerate what is highly unpleasant. This idea of pleasant, unpleasant, and neither pleasant nor unpleasant is another central theme in, in the Buddha's teachings. He called this, we call this feeling tone or hedonic tone, the Buddha called it Vedana. He said all things hinge on Vedana because it's usually the, well, it works both ways, you know, like I have a friend who's in the throes of addiction and just went into like a 45 day rehab. And, uh, you know, his experience is just the incredible pull of these hits of pleasant experience. Yeah. Uh, and we all have that to some degree, you know, the, that's why social media is so much fun. Like the, little pits of dopamine you get when people like your, your article or um, the hits we get from <clears throat> all, all the things that are addictive, you know, Netflix or scrolling the internet, that's kind of pleasantness to the mind being engaged in some way that's not self-cherishing or like worrying about our problems. <laughs> Um, the problem is that in these examples of things that they do concentrate the mind in a certain sort of way. So there is a kind of like a little bit of a relief, but it's just temporary because as soon as the, as soon as you've binged the season and the show's over, you're right back to where you started. There's been no progress, nothing, no underlying condition has been reset in any kind of meaningful way. Um, so seeking what's pleasurable and then avoiding what's unpleasant and like this, like the pervasiveness when you begin to check in, like every movement of mind, every thought, every impulse, every action to some degree or another is aligned along this principle of like minimizing discomfort and increasing comfort minimizing what's unpleasant, increasing what's pleasant, and God forbid something would be neutral. <laughs> That's like a kind of uh, form of torture for so many of us that are used to like the mind being engaged and stimulated. Uh, <clears throat> neutral is often associated with boredom. Uh, paradoxically, like neutral, when we really look at neutral, neither pleasant nor unpleasant, it's actually a kind of, a, a, it's kind of the ground for equanimity. You know? Like when there's nothing to complain about and nothing to be striving towards. Uh, <clears throat> but in the mind that's used to a lot of stimulation, the mind that's used to the big rushes and the inevitable crashes after the big rushes, it, it it's, even neutral takes on a kind of valence of unpleasant. But this is all happening in the mind, you know, like, I mean, there are unpleasant bodily experiences. There's pain in the body or sickness. The Buddha actually called that dukkha dukkha. It's like pain, pain or suffering, suffering. And, uh, and we can certainly develop even in those realms, a kind of different relationship with the pain. This is what he's talking about. When touched by a painful feeling, he will not worry nor grieve nor lament. He will not beat his breast or weep, nor will he be distraught. It is one kind of feeling he experiences a bodily one, not a mental one. And so the crux of all this is developing the capacity to be with what's unpleasant. Develop a kind of tolerance for it. Um, we all have a kind of zo zone of tolerance and in this practice we can expand the zone of tolerance 
Uh, and we do this all the time, you know, just committing to sit down for a period of meditation. You're inevitably going to be plagued by something uncomfortable. And your ability to sit through that is the beginning of developing this kind of capacity for being with what's unpleasant. And if you practice long enough, you know, inevitably, what Jack Cornfield calls the orphans of the heart begin to appear, the undigested experiences that we've been too busy or too engaged to digest. Uh, and my sense is that since the pandemic, like a lot of us are just in backlog, even though in theory, the pandemic was a time of like doing less and a lot of people were kind of on forced retreat. Um, <clears throat> for many of us, so much loss during that time. And then, uh, I mean, people being lost and then the loss of connection and the, like, uh, the great, uh, they call it the great retirement of the great uh, people realizing the sort of the emptiness of their jobs and uh, especially low wage, high demand jobs. And um, <clears throat> so anyway, I just have this sense being around people that like, oh, there's a lot of this that's pent up. And uh, I spend a lot of my time teaching retreats. So when people come and they come on retreat, this is sort of the predominant theme of like, all this experience that's just undigested that begins to appear. And it's actually, you know, an indication of healing, but the, it's very unpleasant. <laughs> you know, when grief shows up, it's very unpleasant. When uh, sorrow and lamentation show up, it's very, regrets show up, it's very unpleasant. And there is some finesse or some kind of discernment required. Like I like to analogize it to lifting weights. I used to really enjoy lifting weights. If you lift weights that are too light, you're not really accomplishing anything. You're not gonna get stronger if that's your goal. So like if we just let the mind be distracted when things are unpleasant or let the mind zone out or turn to something else when things are unpleasant, you know, we're not building that capacity. But by the same token, if we lift weights that are too heavy, then, you know, we're bound to get injured. We're developing a kind of uh, sensitivity to like, what can the system handle in this moment? I like to drop in a question, you know, is this manageable in this moment? Like right now my right foot is asleep and it's, you know, moderately uncomfortable. Uh, and so I can drop in the question, like, is this manageable in this moment? And you know, I feel pretty resourced. I'm not overwhelmed. Uh, so it's fine. I can rest with that level of discomfort. You know, other situations where there's like, uh, more load on the body and mind and bandwidth for unpleasant is more limited then I might make an adjustment to the body in some way. The ability, the ability to tolerate what is unpleasant is a kind of a superpower. Yeah. Like, and one that it bodes well for us to cultivate because uh, I don't think it's getting any easier. <laughs> I mean, maybe AI will come along and save the day and create a kind of utopia of it. Uh, I mean, I just think about climate change and we're watching it happen and things are going to be more and more challenging for all of us. It's just the beginning of what is unfolding. And so um, some of us have to have the kind of resilience to be able to um, stand steady in the face of difficulty, to access wisdom, to be supportive of others, um, all the things that will be called upon. Um, I went through a phase where I got really uh, fascinated by these uh, dystopic uh, series um, 
some of them are actually quite good on an entertainment level. There's Station Eleven. I don't know if any of you saw that. It's about a a virus uh, eradicates a lot of humanity, and there's a kind of dystopic society. But they find meaning through art and expression. And, uh, and there's another one. I forget the name of it. Where there's like a fungus that kind of takes over and. Uh, And I always think like in a dystopic environment, like I don't, you know, I'm not a fighter, I'm not good with weapons, I don't know how to build things, I don't have medical uh, experience, I could be kind of like semi useless in a society like that, except that I would, my goal is to start a cult. <laughs> so I'm just planting the seeds so that when that happens, uh, you know where to find me. <laughs> There's always one of those figures in these in these shows and movies that you know, has harnessed the collective to get things done. For about two years, my primary practice was just focusing on pleasant and unpleasant and neutral. Every time I encountered unpleasant, you know, it's one thing just to be able to like have that facility to like ride through the day being aware of pleasant and unpleasant but the real fruit of that is to notice how the mind's reacting mind inevitably tensing or um, <clears throat> for me it's complaining i'm trained as a lawyer uh, we are uh, trained to catastrophize, to see worst case scenarios, to take it to its extreme, uh, and also to, you know, to complain, you know, like to make an art, make the arguments against and uh, prosecute the case for why it shouldn't be this way. Uh, <clears throat> that's all extra, you know, that's all extra things that there's an unpleasant thing happening, and then my mind is just making it worse. Uh, one of one of the teachers who's been most inspirational to me, Gil Fransdale, he always says, you know, like our job as meditators is to try to make things better, and definitely to notice when we're making them worse, and just don't make it worse. It's bad enough as it is. You know, all of this is happening on the level of it, 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 all this is happening on the level of awareness. It's like it's it's all appearing in the mind. Um, there's a way in which I could say it's not real <laughs> because it's all mental fabrications and maybe very unique because of our conditioning. The same experience, uh, you know, I hear electronic dance music and I think very unpleasant you know, the next person hears that music and they get really excited uh, and then that same person who loves EDM like when they're trying to sleep it's very unpleasant like that's the, the that even the unpleasantness and pleasantness that we're you know can come to dominate so much our life is fabricated and variable and transitory uh, first piece of pie, delicious. Fifth piece of pie, really disgusting. <laughs> Stomach cake producing. Um, so it's one thing to be able to, you know, just discern that all this is happening and that these forces are um, omnipresent. You know, this Veda now or feeling tone is what it's called a universal factor of mind in every moment of consciousness. Every time um, there's some sense contact, there's an immediate co-arising sense of pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. So it's so ubiquitous that, you know, it, it's a great skill to develop, to notice it, but then even more to notice how we're reacting to it. And that's where the grist for the mill is, you know. I went through a very, very difficult situation in a two-year Dharma study program I was leading at Spirit Rock with some colleagues and uh, it's a sign of the times. You know, 
there were insensitive racially themed jokes were made and people got really upset and uh you know it, it, i don't think i've ever been in so much sort of like uh, angry traumatized energy you know and you know and our job as teachers is like you know we're trying to create harmony we're trying to like study these teachings we want everybody to get along and uh <clears throat> this is very challenging, you know, and this has been sort of like the theme of, you know, ever since like about 2016, there's just a lot of this is in the air. And uh, one of my colleagues uh, was just seemed quite steady in all of this, you know, like uh, unwavering, steady, you know, didn't get bent out of shape the way some of us did internally, you know, I kept it together on the externally, but I was like uh, really affected by it. And I, and I asked my, my friend and colleague, you know, like how, how are you so steady? And he said, you know, I really learned to tolerate unpleasant Vedana. It's so, it's so simple. It almost sounds, I must laugh at hearing that expression, but it's so profound, you know, that we can develop this capacity to be in a field of intense suffering, of intensity, of uh, emotion and energy, and we can be unwavering in, in that. Like, this is possible. Like, I've seen it with my own eyes <laughs> in people that, you know, have dedicated their life to this practice and the cultivation of this. Uh, path of living. And there's a paradox here, uh, and this is where I'll end, that Leonard Cohen says, uh, I know the burden's heavy as you wheel it through the night. The guru says it's empty, but it doesn't mean it's light. I like the kind of, uh, it is both empty and really heavy. <laughs> and he was sort of like, begin to vacillate between moments of like just uh, surrendering to the tragedy of it all and the uh, and there is something in the body that like the animal body needs to grieve or like, energies need to move through in a certain way but then having the ability to also see that on one level it, it's all empty. Maybe one more quote. <clears throat> this is from Ajahn Chah, the Thai forest master. He uses this concept of the original mind, which is uh, you know, not the discursive mind that's sort of making judgments and comparisons and evaluations and laments, but uh, a kind of capital M mind. The original mind does not get affected by mind objects. It doesn't chase after the different kinds of pleasant and unpleasant mind objects. Rather, the original mind is a state of continuous knowing and wakefulness, thoroughly mindful of all it's experiencing. When the mind is like this, no unpleasant or pleasant mind objects it experiences will be able to disturb it. The mind doesn't become anything and nothing can shake it. I love this, the state of continuing knowing and wakefulness. It's the, it's the knowing, you know, that's why so much emphasis on awareness here. It's the knowing of the experience that frees us. The, the mindfulness that knows sadness is not sad. The mindfulness that knows anxiety is not anxious. So keep taking the big step backward. That's our inevitable path to, um, what's there underneath this, which is like a profound state of well-being, a kind of just, uh, uh, one of my teachers used to say, just to be alive is enough, you know, like 
just to be alive is enough. So I'll end there and just uh, maybe we'll let those words settle for 30 seconds. And then you can notice what comes to mind when you 